out of this. Greetings, I'm Shad. And even considering the difficulties we face in the modern day, we're actually living in an unprecedented time of prosperity. And when you look at those of us who are lucky to live in first world countries, even the hardest of our modern day times is still orders of magnitude better than the best times of the past, certain times of the past. And when you look at some of the worst times of the past, it is shocking. Like, like truly, and it has caused me to honestly feel very lucky and blessed. And this is actually the subject of this video. We're gonna be looking at one of the worst times of the past. In fact, some people say the greatest catastrophe that's ever befallen, uh, you know, a society of people, and that is the Black Death. And I tell you what, when researching this video, I have been struck with such an overwhelming measure of a sense, a feeling of gratitude for the time I get to live in and the luxuries I get to enjoy. And before we dive into the Black Death, I do want to actually talk about one of my favorite luxuries of the modern day, and that is Audible. And they're doing something that's honestly really brilliant to help out those of us who are stuck at home and need something to help occupy us. Audible has launched something called Audible Stories, and you can find them by going to stories.audible.com where they have made available hundreds of audiobooks absolutely for free, just right there. There's no strings attached. You don't need to sign up, you don't need to log in, you don't need to pay a cent. You just go to stories.audible.com and you can stream, listen to a selection of brilliant audiobooks absolutely for free. And I think that's just wonderful, honestly. Now, in addition to that, Regularly, when you go to say www.audible.com forward slash Shadowversity, or if you're in the US, you text Shadowversity to 500 500, their standard deal is that you can get your first audiobook for free if you sign up to give them a try for a month. And in addition to that first free audiobook, you usually get two Audible Originals, which is an audiobook only available on Audible and you get them for free. What Audible are doing now is opening up their selection of Audible Originals. So you get the first audiobook plus all their Audible originals, okay? Access to them all uh, to help people out pass the time during these difficult times. And if you are wondering which free audiobook you should grab, I would suggest my own audiobook, Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror. It's a dark, epic fantasy. Even though it's fantasy, it deals with some of the brutal realities that happen from the choices that humans you know, have made in the past. So if you like a dark, challenging fantasy, I do recommend it. And you can grab that very audiobook and access to hours and hours of entertainment if you just go to www.audible.com forward slash Shadowversity, texting Shadowversity to 500-500 if you're in the US. It's just awesome. I love Audible. Thank you to them for sponsoring this video. And now we're going to get back to the subject, which is the Black Death. As I begin pointing out some of the misconceptions of the Black Death and getting into the facts of what it was, what happened, I would ask you to just bear with me if I get emotional. I don't know if I will, but when researching this video, I did get emotional, and so that might come back. And it really got to me. The reason being is that the more I learn of the past, the more real the people of the past have become, because, uh, Far from being statistics, facts, I found them to be people, so similar to me. They had similar hopes, dreams, and desires. They wanted the best for themselves, their families, their loved ones, their children. And they worked to improve the world. Even if that's improving their own condition, that was working to improve the world. And... Uh, they had to endure, like, I'm so lucky. And uh, the things that they had to get, go through for what I take as such basic, some people even consider rights. It's a right to have these luxuries. They had to work pretty darn hard to just obtain heat in my home. I can press a button and warm my home. I don't need to break my back collecting firewood and keeping a fire burning all the time. I can have hot water on demand instantly, whenever I want. I don't need to prepare anything for it. I can bring light into my home with the flick of a switch. I have access to healthy, tasty, plentiful food just by going down the street and getting it whenever I want, for the most part, okay? 
difficulties can arrive, but that is the kind of standard we try and achieve in the modern day. When I get an infection, I don't need to worry about dying. And when a pandemic hits, I don't need to worry about my family dying or having to struggle with the decision that I might need to abandon them just to survive. This is how lucky we are in the modern day. These are some of the horrors that people had to endure. But they endured it to try and better their own life and better the lives of their children. And this is the thing that can get to me. We are their children. Ultimately, they did this for us, their descendants. And even with the difficulties that exist in the modern day, we are still so blessed and we are positioned to endure it and survive it so much better. Thanks to them. So what was the Black Death? It was a plague. One of the things that people don't actually understand is that there were several pandemics of the bubonic plague, okay? The Black Death was actually the worst case of it, but the bubonic plague has arisen multiple times throughout the past, sometimes much closer to the modern day than you would expect. But the Black Death specifically was the worst case of it, and by far the most devastating. There have actually been three identified plague pandemics, and the first one arose about in the 6th century AD. Second, the Black Death, as I mentioned, the worst, and uh, it was kind of like aftershocks of the Black Death of it arising in smaller pockets after the massive wave with such a huge death toll. But that is kind of all counted within the event known as the Black Death. The third case of the plague pandemic was actually in Asia in 1890. And that one is actually where some of the misconceptions actually arise, specifically in how it was spread. But more on that later. The Black Death arrived in Europe in 1347 and would quickly spread across all of Europe and would only come under a measure of control after a catastrophic loss of life by 1352. It took five years for this plague pandemic to run its course. One historian has dubbed it Magna Mortalitas for the sheer number of dead. One observer wrote that there was scarcely enough living to bury the dead. An Augustinian monk named uh, Henry Knighton wrote this about the Black Death. There was a general mortality throughout the world. Sheep and oxen strayed through the fields and among the crops, and there was none to drive them off or collect them, but they perished in uncounted numbers for lack of shepherds. After the pestilence, many buildings fell into a total ruin for lack of inhabitants. Similarly, many small villages and hamlets became desolate, for all those who dwelt in them had died. What was the percentage of dead in the Black Death? And this is the staggering thing. I, I want you to try and comprehend and process this number. It was 60% of the population, reduced from 80 million to 30 million, an estimated 50 million deaths. To put this into perspective, World War II had a staggering casualty rate, but on a percentage scale, it's not even a fraction close to the scale that happened in the Black Death. So in World War II, an estimated 75 to 80 million deaths, which is unbelievable. I'm not trying to downplay it. Yet out of all the countries that were involved in World War II, ultimately that accounted for 3 to 3.7 percent of the population of the time. We're talking about a loss in life for the population of medieval Europe of 60%. That is worse than the Thanos snap from Marvel Endgame, Infinity War and Endgame. Think about this. Think about over half of the people in your immediate circle dying. That's, that's what we're talking about. Like, worse than the Thanos snap, just to put it in perspective. You need to understand that this wasn't a uniform dispersion. There were pockets of much higher death much lower deaths. As the account from Henry Knighton just mentioned, there were cases of whole communities just dying completely, completely wiped out. And there are some cases of communities that were very secluded and survived it without a single death. And then it all kind of balances out to where we reach this 60% figure. But think about that. There are cases of entire communities where everyone died. 
Uh, it's astounding and staggering, and I could only imagine how horrifying that would be. Because these are people in a much different situation than us. They had very poor medical technology in the time. More on that later. Even with the staggering amount of life lost, a medieval society, in some ways, were better equipped to weather such a loss of life uh, than we are in the modern day. In the modern day, we are much better equipped to prevent the loss of life in the first place. So I'm not sure we could say that, uh, you know, it'd be better to be in the medieval period. But if we lost that amount of life in the modern day, our current society would collapse because our production chains have far more bottlenecks than in the medieval period. People of that time were actually far more independent and capable of supporting themselves than we are, okay? They knew how to grow their food, how to look after themselves much better than we do. If we lost the supply chains to our uh, supermarkets and electricity and gas ceased coming to our homes, it would be a staggering amount of chaos of the likes that we have never seen. So uh, that's one interesting kind of thing to compare about the medieval period, that they, even with the loss of life, even with how devastating it was, they were able to... Uh, ultimately recover. It took a long time, of course, but they were able to continue on. And on this note of kind of comparing the modern day to the past, the uh, bubonic plague of the Black Death spread a bit slower than what we see pandemics spread in the modern day. The world is far more connected in the modern day, and we see diseases jump continents instantly because of flight and other things. It took about a year for the bubonic plague to spread across Europe from the places in which it first kind of appeared, which is like uh, Italy and uh, Southern Eastern Europe and stuff, uh, all the way across to Britain, about a year's time. But then it lasted for five years, having a massive death toll. So how did it spread specifically? And this is where we have one of the biggest misconceptions about the Black Plague. And that is the assumption that it was spread by the fleas on the rats. There's actually, you know, when people have looked into this and studied in detail, there's no evidence for it. But there is evidence for a later plague, and that is being applied too broadly and assumed to have been the case for the medieval Black Death, when actually, in fact, it's not. No correlation has been found in the population of rats or reports of rat epidemics or other similar rodents during the time of the Black Death. And such a thing would have been made note of, that there were rats everywhere, because an interesting correlating thing does appear in the third pandemic of the plague, okay? So remember those like three main ones? In the third one, plague cases and deaths actually followed the same seasonal fertility cycle of certain species of rat fleas. That's where the correlation was found. And that's, you know, the connection there. But like I said, no such correlation exists with the medieval Black Plague. And in addition, there are correlating reports in later cases of the plague of rat falls. Think about what that word implies, rat falls, okay? That's the number of rats we're kind of talking about that correlate to when they're the main culprit of spreading the plague. And uh, th these are reports from Africa, also China, and they come from around the 18th century. So a rat fall kind of event like that would be very noteful to observe. And uh, you'd think someone would have you know, made a record of it if such, you know, an event, a scene like that, befell someone in the medieval period. But there's no account of that ever happening. So unfortunately, that video game, A Plague's Tale, with the rats everywhere, is not historical. I mean, it works fine for, you know, a fictional video game, but historically, that wasn't the case. How did the medieval plague then spread? And I'm going to read this one because there's some specific wording. It actually seems to be the case that the medieval bubonic plague was actually spread with the combined interplay between the bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic plagues, which caused its spread to travel much faster than if it was limited to the migration patterns of rats. And so what we're actually seeing here, because this is the thing, I mean, rats, you know, yes, they migrate, but not particularly fast, okay? And on the medieval scale, having a pandemic like this spread across an entire continent in this time of a year is relatively fast in comparison. And uh, 
it wouldn't have been spread that fast if it was carried by rats. So it was actually spread through a very virulent version of the plague that had interplay and possibly even certain mutations with other types of, you know, strains of, you know, sicknesses and plague as well, which caused it to be far more catchy, unfortunately. And once again, that was the interplay between the bubonic, the pneumonic, and septicemic plagues. So it was pretty vicious. So this is the other thing that helps dispel the idea that rats were the ones that uh, proliferated the spread of the plague, and it is that the spread of the plague, or rate in which it was spread, can be charted somewhat to about one mile a day, but in some cases up to eight miles a day. And the other thing is once rats migrate and find a place where they're happy, they stay, they, they stop moving. But the plague continued to spread at a mile a day. And you need to understand that medieval people didn't know, especially at first, what caused it, okay? They're, ultimately, they did resort to strict quarantine. In actual fact, one of the assumptions in what they believed spread the plague was in foul smell. Now, the uh, miasmic kind of theory of sicknesses, which is what ultimately is miasma, is the idea that foul smell spreads sickness, got far more developed later on, and in the medieval period it was an idea, and they did enact certain countermeasures to fight against bad smells. In 1349, Edward III of England wrote to the mayor of London, and he ordered the streets of London to be cleaned, and this was his quote, the streets were foul with human feces, and the air of the city poisoned to the great danger of men passing, especially in this time of infectious disease. And so that is again the idea that horrible smells carry disease. And this is when we come to another misconception of the Black Plague, and that is the plague mask that is very distinctive and iconic and associated with the Black Plague. But this is the thing, those plague masks didn't exist during the Black Plague. They're from the Renaissance, later, all right? Now, the logic behind these plague masks is actually tied with the miasmic theory of medicine, which is in bad smells. And so the whole purpose of this long nose was to put nice smelling scented herbs, spices, and other things in that nose cavity so they could breathe in sweet, you know, fresh, nice smelling kind of fumes to protect them from the foul fumes that carry disease. So it's tied with that theory, but the masks themselves didn't exist in the medieval period. They come from the doctors of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And it's just interesting to note that uh, pockets of the plague did, you know, uh, appear during, you know, times later, but not to the huge scale of the Black Plague for a very significant reason, which I'll go into when I start to describe how they overcame it. Because once they overcame it, well, there was a bit more resistance to it because most people had died. But anyway, more on that later. So one other, you know, point of evidence which dispels the rat myth is that there were some cities that were pretty big hubs of trade and commerce which would have had a very high rat population in comparison, with, which actually survived uh, fairly, well, mostly unscathed from cases of the plague. And these were the cities of Milan and Dudue. <laughs> Horrible at pronouncing these words. It, that's in Flanders. They actually survived the length of the Black Death nearly unscathed. So, yeah, if the rats were the ones carrying this, with people bringing trade goods in and out, with rats coming in with them and things like that, it would have hit these areas pretty severely, but it didn't. In terms of remedies and ways to treat it, most of it was just hokum, okay? And uh, there's actually an account from Chaucer that says, many a doctor earned a pretty penny by peddling, you know, cure so-called cures or remedies and stuff uh, but more often than not the actual doctors of the time period weren't there to treat the disease because if they were being honest they didn't have anything they, they knew could treat it and they were mainly there to just record the deaths the most iconic symptom of the black plague are swellings which can so you know look like either markings on the skin or growing kind of bulbous nodules almost and these nodules can look like uh, you know, swollen, sweaty, uh, uh, fleshy lumps, oftentimes appearing black or partially black. And they can grow from the size of a grape to the size of, say, an egg, and commonly appearing around the neck, armpits, and groin, but sometimes just across the whole body. Accompanying these swellings are feelings of lethargy, okay, so low energy, you feel horribly sick, of course, your whole body aching, a feeling of 
cold, yet at the same time you would have a really high fever and you would cough up blood. So it's hor it's horrifying, it's terrible. Like, it, this is a, just a vicious, horrible disease. And uh, when people contracted it, they could die in a couple of hours, depending on the strain. I could you imagine that. The more common rate of death would be within a day to five days of contracting the disease. You, I can only imagine how terrifying it would be because some people could survive it, very few, but for the most part, it was a death sentence. If you contracted the Black Death, chances were you were going to die. And you could die in a couple of hours, and unless you were one of the lucky few to survive, a couple of days. So uh, the other thing about this is how uh, virulent the spread was. So if someone had this disease and you were in proximity to them, it was a very high chance, unless you were miraculously immune, you would catch it too. With the Black Death specifically, it affected all of society, okay? Whether you are rich, merchants, peasants, kings, clergy, it hit everyone. If you were in proximity, you could catch it. How did people deal with the Black Death? And this is where things can be really, really rough. Because uh, they didn't know how to treat it, and chances were, very high chances, if you contracted it, you would die. So what choices did people have? Heavy quarantine was practiced in many regions, and their quarantine period? 40 days sometimes. Uh, it, it kind of started to get lower and lower, but that's only with like 30 days and then maybe 20. But the average seems to be between 30 and 40 days of full quarantine. Now, imagine how rough that would have been in the medieval period. They couldn't watch TV. They couldn't, you know, listen to audiobooks. They couldn't play video games or any number of things. And I'm not saying quarantine isn't rough for us in the modern day. I'm just saying it was so much worse for them, all right? And that's what they had to deal with. The other difficult thing about quarantine is that in the medieval context, you needed to work much more for your own survival, to get food, to keep yourself warm, especially in winters and types of winters that could hit certain parts of Europe, Britain, and so on. So if you had to be quarantined, how could you help, you know, protect yourself? In some cases, one person was allowed to leave, that people would avoid him, of course. But in other cases, they, like, if it was a whole family or something like that, they would need to rely on other people's generosity to survive, to bring them food, firewood, and other things to live, and they would just have to get by. If they could survive the quarantine, they would need to find ways to amuse themselves, sharing stories one to another, playing games and other things but it would have been very rough and very difficult to get through it. The scary thing is, a common practice would be if one person fell sick with the Black Death, they wouldn't know if there were other people in the household who might have contracted it but haven't had any symptoms appear yet, and so the whole house would need to be put down on quarantine. Sometimes this was enforced very aggressively, but if you quarantine anybody with someone who has the plague, that basically means everyone in that household is gonna contract the plague, and it's only a matter of time until they all die, unless someone was lucky enough to be immune. And so, one person gets a black death, the whole household would die. But that is only in cases where it could be enforced. It comes down to personal choice. And there was an obvious reality that had struck many people, and that was, near certain death, or save yourself. For myself, I know if I contracted, and I was in that period, if I contracted the Black Death and I had symptoms, I would send my entire family away to try and save their lives. And I would happily die alone. I don't know what I would do if it was one of my children. And this is the choice that a lot of parents had to choose. Many chose to stay with their children and die with them, that they wouldn't have to die alone. I think that's what I would ultimately choose. But I understand the choice, and this wouldn't have been an easy choice, where sisters, brothers, children, and parents chose to abandon their loved ones so they wouldn't die as well. I can only imagine how heartbreaking and difficult that would have been.
And it was a common thing that people had to do to survive. I would never blame or judge anyone for making that choice. I've certainly never been in such a situation. And I know if, well, as I mentioned, if I had such a disease, I would want my family to move away. Of course, I don't think children would be able to be that emotionally mature. It would be hard for them to comprehend what was happening to them. But what a horrifying reality, because just remember how lethal this was and how many people it killed. 60% of the population. And think about that account, was it from Chaucer? Where entire villages just became ghost towns. Everyone had died. If you walked to that town, it would just be littered with corpses in there, on, either on the streets or in their homes. Death everywhere. And then the homes would start to fall into disrepair. Flocks and animals walking around unattended. It would be a hellscape. And of course, villages like that, you would run away from. You would just avoid, like the plague, kind of an appropriate term that has arisen out of that. Because that was the other way that people could try and protect themselves, was to avoid the plague like the plague. And if they used heavy quarantine measures, that was how they could ultimately survive. And of course, they needed to dispose of the dead either going in. And it was hard to find the information as to how long the infection stayed on the, the corpses of people who had died from it, and what time it would be safe to actually handle the dead to bury them. Because if you went in and you'd want to, especially if there was a loved one and you cared for them, you would want to bury them. But because there is a time of infection shortly after death, you could get infected again. So sometimes to protect anyone from getting infected, and if the whole family had died from this, if there was no risk of the fire spreading to other houses, they could just burn down the entire house to protect the surrounding community from the infection. The ultimate way in which the Black Plague had run its course was that really most, there were some people who escaped when they enacted heavy quarantine, but most people who were most susceptible to this disease had died from it. There's not really a thing like herd immunity because uh, it's not like you could survive it and build antibodies um, and just resist it from there on because most people who got it simply died from it. And the population that remained were the, either the ones that practiced heavy quarantine or the ones that were more naturally resistant and immune to the disease. And that is why later kind of outbreaks of the plague were nearly as devastating as the main Black Plague, because the outbreak would hit an area where people were either more susceptible, hadn't hit before, or other things like that. But it was more difficult to spread because the population, in a large measure, unfortunately had their most vulnerable already die from it. The other thing that we need to understand about the Black Plague is that people still had to live their lives, all right? And so they had to risk, you know, getting sick to plant crops, okay? Farm, produce food, keep themselves warm, make clothing, any number of things to help people live, they still had to do. And so things just had to progress and uh, they had to deal with this horrifying danger of the plague. And if it arose in, you know, your community, your family, it's a horrifying thing that you would just have to deal with, potentially die from, but the people ultimately did survive. There was 40% that survived. And with the measures that they were able to put in place, sometimes worked, not always, but they were able to get through it and ultimately recover from it. And when I look back on this, like I said at the beginning of this video, I am just left with a profound sense of gratitude. I'm so lucky that I'm living today and not back then. And I am grateful for the things that you know, the people of the past have endured to help bring us to the time we are living in right now, where at the difficult times of the modern day, are orders of magnitude better than some of the best times of the past. So thank you for joining me with this uh, detailed look at the Black Plague, where we dispelled some of the misconceptions, but also learnt a bit more about it and try and put ourselves in their shoes, figure out what it would have been like. I appreciate you watching the video, and of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.